Shalom, and welcome to my home in the old city of Jerusalem. You're probably wondering what that painting is in the background, so I might as well tell you. This is a painting by Moshe Zvi who made a painting for every one of the 150 chapters of the Book of Psalms. And this is chapter 14, about the final redemption. It's all full of Kabbalistic illusions, which I will not go into now, but that's what it is. And if you're wondering about the pillows on my couch, these are made by Ethiopians, Ethiopians who live here, Ethiopian Jews who live here in Israel, who made these embroideries of, of uh, biblical scenes where the protagonist is black because they're Ethiopians. Okay, so that's, so now you're in closer in, in my living room and I'm, I'm gonna continue with the long and winding road. Where I left off is I had spent almost 15 years in the ashram. We were universalists, meaning that we believed that all religions were equally valid paths that led up to the top of the mountain. At the top of the mountain, all the paths came together. And so we had a temple of the universal spirit where we used to invite representatives from different religions. We had representatives from Christianity and, and Buddhism, other Hindu representatives, a Jain representative. And the Jewish representative that we usually invited was a Jewish renewal rabbi. But at one point, we invited an Orthodox rabbi. Now, we had a woman, a Hindu woman living at the ashram, a woman from India, named Shuma Chakrabarti. And she was a teaching assistant for Elie Wiesel at Boston University. And through Elie Wiesel, she came to know Rabbi Joseph Pollock, who was the Hill rabbi at Boston University for many years. And she invited Rabbi Pollock to come and speak at the ashram and to speak about Judaism. And he accepted and, uh, and he came. And he spoke about love of God, even unto madness. And I sat there thinking, what? I went to Hebrew school until I was 18 years old and went away to college. And I went to Shul every Friday night and every Shabbos morning. And I never heard our conservative rabbi ever use the words love of God. Those words like were not spoken in our conservative synagogue. I mean, the word God was barely spoken, except in the prayers where they were just kind of read, not taken so seriously. But the uh, words love of God, it just wasn't anything I'd ever heard. So, um, I really started wondering what half the, he was quoting Maimonides. Now, I had studied Maimonides, and I knew that Maimonides was a mainstream Jewish thinker. He wasn't, a, he wasn't like a fringe figure. And I'm thinking, how can this be part of Judaism, love of God, and I don't know it? So I was really just in shock. After the uh, service, Rabbi Pollock invited me to come to his home for Shabbat. <laughs> and I... Uh, you know, he put his phone number, his name and phone number, a little scrap of paper. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to that Orthodox rabbi for Shabbat because I know what he's going to try to do. He's going to try to get me out of the ashram. So I put that little piece of paper in a drawer and <laughs> had nothing to do with it. But it was a very bad time. This was November of 1984. Now, 1984 was a terrible year for the New Age world. I was, of course, very much part of the New Age world. One Swami guru, then leader after another, were found to be having you know, sexual scandals. It started with Baker Roshi of the San Francisco Zen Center. Now, the San Francisco Zen Center was the creme de la creme of the New Age world. I mean, these were serious meditators who, you know, very straight backs who spent hours meditating. And Baker Roshi was a really brilliant Zen Roshi, and it turned out that he was having an affair, not only with one of his students, and not only with a married student, but with a student who was married to his best friend. So it was a terrible scandal, and everybody was like in total like consternation about it. And then just a few weeks later, another scandal came out about Swami Muktananda, and after a couple of weeks after, it was like dominoes. One, every two weeks, it was another sexual scandal with another um, 
Hindu or Buddhist leader. And, uh, and so 1984 was not a good year for the New Age world. There was, the problem was that all of these people were preaching celibacy and not living it. Or among, among the Zen Roshis, you could be married, but you're supposed to be monog monogamous. <laughs> among the Hindu Swamis, you're supposed to be celibate. Whatever it was, there was a big gap between what people were preaching and what they were living. And that really uh, was very disillusioning for me. Also, after 14 and a half years in the ashram, I read a book by a woman who had spent something like 30 years. She was a disciple of a, a, another uh, Swami who was out in California. And her book was a very honest uh, uh, portrayal of her own spiritual journey and how she tried, I and mean, she meditated and meditated for years. She, her goal was samadhi. Samadhi is like the highest state of consciousness of, of uninterrupted God consciousness. This was also really our state, our goal at the ashram, what was called samaj samadhi. Samadhi is this high state of, of union with God and samaj samadhi is like to have it all the time when you're walking down the street, when you're relaxing in the living room at all times. Well, this woman never attained it. And she was there like 30 years on this path. And I started thinking, what, am I never going to attain it? So after a few months, it took me a few months to open that drawer and take out Rabbi Pollock's uh, name and phone number and dial the phone. I didn't dial, I didn't like that. I dialed the phone with a rotary dial. This was 1985, February. And I went to Rabbi Pollock's for Shabbos. And it was a very lovely Shabbos. And um, afterwards, he was doing what's called a Malava Malka. It's a Saturday night, like a song fest uh, to escort out the Shabbos queen. He was doing it at a local synagogue. Rabbi Nehemia Polin had a synagogue in Everett, Massachusetts, so like a, one of the surrounding towns of Boston. And he was having a spiritual series and he invited Rabbi Pollock. Rabbi Pollock said, come along. I went and he played his guitar and sang Shlomo Karbach songs. And it was very lovely and a nice, you know, really nice ruach. And uh, I enjoyed it. And I picked up a brochure for this spiritual series that this was part of. And I saw that Rabbi David Din was coming to the same synagogue in a couple of weeks. Rabbi David Din was from Borough Park. And he was going to be speaking on Judaism as a yoga. And I thought, wow, I've got to hear this. So I went. And he said the words that changed my life. He said, halacha. And I knew the word halacha. Halacha means Jewish law. He said, halacha comes from the root word meaning, lechet means to walk. He said, halacha is a spiritual path. It takes you somewhere. <sighs> well, I knew hundreds and hundreds of Jews. And I didn't know a single Jew who regarded Judaism as a spiritual path that takes you somewhere. Not one. I mean, I came from this very strong large conservative community of many shuls in the Philadelphia area it's in Southern New Jersey, it was now called Cherry Hill. And uh, we had three conservative synagogue, uh, one reform and one Orthodox. I didn't know a single Jew that regarded Judaism as a spiritual path. And also I went to Brandeis when it was 80% Jewish. <laughs> I'm like, Judaism is a spiritual path that takes you somewhere? What? And that's what Rabbi Abed did said. And I was like intrigued because if Judaism is a spiritual path that takes you somewhere, why am I on a Hindu path, <laughs> you know? Because I didn't think Judaism was a spiritual path that took me somewhere. The truth is, and I guess I'm going back to like the story winds around, but 
after I'd come back from my year in India, in 19, this was by now 1970, I was at Brandeis finishing my senior year. And I was getting, when I came back from India, everyone said to me, oh, you missed Rabbi Art Green. It's this amazing rabbi, so different. He was the founder of the Chabura movement. And he was at Brandeis the year you were away and you missed him. But you've got to meet this guy. And he was now at Harvard. So I called him and he was always busy, always busy. And I tried him a couple of times during the year. Finally, it was a week before I was going to graduate. And uh, I called Rabbi Green. And, and I said, you know, I'm going to graduate. I'm leaving Boston. My idea was to go back with my uh, parents back to Philadelphia and get a job as a journalist or something. And, um, and I said, is there any chance really that I can meet you. And he said, well, I'm very busy, but if you can meet me tonight at midnight at Harvard Square, I can talk with you. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and we met at Harvard Square at midnight. <laughs> and we walked round and around Harvard Square. And I was asking him for a Jewish place where I could practice spiritual practice full time. And he couldn't think of any. And he, he's the one who told me about the ashram because he had just been at the ashram with his wife, Kathy, who became my friends. Uh, he had just been at the ashram the previous Sunday. He told me about this beautiful place, 21 acres of woods, just an hour's ride south of Boston. And he told me about it. So at that point, 1970, you know, when I was looking for a Jewish place, I, I didn't find it. And here now it's 1985, and Rabbi David Din is saying that you don't need a place to practice spiritual practice full time. Judaism itself, wherever you are, is a full time spiritual path. And I was like, wow. So, meanwhile, I had written a book. It was a biography of Rabbi Paramananda, the founder of our ashram. And, um, and the book was. The, the book was called A Bridge of Dreams, and it was published by Chris Bamford, who had, uh, I forget the name of the publisher, but anyway, it, my guru, is her, it was her guru, my guru's guru, and she loved the book. And she gave me as a reward $2,000 and two months to go anywhere in the world that I wanted. And... Um, and $2,000 was like a huge amount of money. At the ashram, when I came in 1970, we got $10 a month. The monastic members got $10 a month spending money. I mean, what, do, what did we need money for? We had to go to the dentist, the ashram paid. It was like a kibbutz. So um, by the time I left in 1985, we were getting $20 a month. So $2,000 was a lot of money. <laughs> and two months to go anywhere on what I wanted. And I thought, you know, like I was really burned out. I was really burned out. 15 years in the ashram. Oh, <laughs> we're striving, working on myself and fighting a very, the very natural de desires to, to have a relationship, to get, to get married. It was very hard. So, um, so I thought I'm going to go to Baro Baro. And I went to the a uh, travel agency and brought him all these these uh, travel brochures for Borough Borough. And instead I went to Borough Park. <laughs> I followed Rabbi David Din down to Bor Borough Park to learn about what I call Jewish mysticism, you know, Kabbalah. And I was in New York and I also met Rabbi Mayor Fund, who was teaching a wonderful book called The Way of God by the Ramchal. And totally like a depth of Judaism that I absolutely had no idea existed. And um, what, what occurred to me was that, you know, it's not that I had ever rejected Judaism. It was just, I really didn't know about the, this depth of what they called Torah. And Rabbi Mayor Fun said to me, if you really want to learn Judaism, you have to go to Jerusalem. 
So uh, I took, I flew to Jerusalem and I started learning. Uh, the first night I was in Jerusalem, I met the two people who would really be my spiritual guides, I would say for the rest of my life. The first one was the Hasidic Rebbe of Amshanov. I was staying with someone who was a Hasid of, this, of the Rebbe of Amshanov and I'd heard about him. And he was a Hasidic rabbi. And those, those days was actually possible to see him. Now it's virtually impossible to see him. But this was 36 uh, years ago, 37 years ago almost. And, uh, and I went, so he would see people like very late at night. And here it was, I was waiting in the, in the and he lived in a small apartment with his seven, seven daughters and his wife a small apartment in the Jerusalem neighborhood of Bayat Vagan. And it was, then it was my turn to go in and see him. The person I was staying with, he had been to see the, to see the rabbi. Now it was my turn. I was going to get to see the rabbi. And I went in and just being in his presence blew me away. Because don't forget, I had been in India. I had spent a year in India. I had had a guru. I, I had met many great souls. And people came to the ashram, the leading swamis and, you know, uh, spiritual lights of the new age world came to the ashram. I had met very, some very impressive people, but I never met anybody who impressed me as much as the Rebbe of Amshinov. Why did he impress me? Because there was no one there. I asked him questions and when he, and when he answered, he wouldn't answer right away. He would put his head down into his hand, and he was clearly receiving answers. And I just got this amazing sense that he was like an empty pipe and God was speaking through him. Because there was no one, there was no ego. There was no ego. He was the humblest person I had ever met. And to this day, he's still the, the humblest person I'd ever met. It was no ego, and I had seen the destruction that the ego can do with spiritual leaders. And I was like, just amazed by him. And throughout my life, I've been continually amazed by the Rebbe. I mean, he's worked miracles in my life. Uh, in my, uh, my book, this, um, here's my latest book. Um, I've been here before, When Souls of the Holocaust Return. So the last chapter is, about, is my own story. And I came to uh, Israel when I was 37 and a half years old. And, uh, and through miracles of the Rebbe, I, I don't know if I'm, <laughs> should I do uh, the Long Winding Road part four and tell more of my story? I don't know where, where, I don't know where I'm gonna end. I can be spontaneous about this. But anyway, the first person I met that night was the Rebbe. The second person I met was Rebison Sapora Heller. Now she at that time had nine children. And I thought, what? That is like crazy. Who could have nine children? That's like, subsequently she had more. Ultimately she had 14 children. She was the most brilliant, not the most, most brilliant woman I've ever met. The most brilliant person I had ever met. And to this day, still the most brilliant person. And she knew everything. And she was just unbelievable. She has a photographic memory. And she knew everything about everything. <laughs> I was like, wow. Because I was very impressed by intellect. But she also was much more than intellect. She became my mentor as well as my teacher. I mean, I went to what was billed as a yeshiva for women who knew, who, you know, knew had little or no Jewish background. I mean, I thought I had a lot of Jewish background. It turned out I really knew Zilch. But um, I would follow her around from class to class. But in the subsequent years, and then she taught right here in my living room for 26 years, once a week here in my living room. I mean, it's not just that she's brilliant. You know, intellect, there can be people with great intellects and who are terrible people a very high percentage of Hitler's SS had PhDs. Intellect does not impress me anymore. It impresses me a little. But what's impressive about Rebbe Sid Heller, who's now, who's, her husband died, and so she, her, she's married a second time, so she's Rebbe Sid Heller Gottlieb. 
What impressed me about her was she was working on herself. She has a tremendous sense of humor. She did tremendous always involved with Chesed, helping people. Chesed means the acts of loving kindness. Always involved in many, many acts of, you know, loving kindness, helping this person and that person. She was like the superwoman. She really did it all while being the mother of 14 children and working full-time as a teacher, a teacher in this, uh, this uh, yeshiva for women. So, um, I promised you that the, oh, so let me take it to, to the end of this chapter in my life. I was supposed to stay for two months and go back at the end of the summer, which is really a little more than two months. The end of the summer was maybe by that time about three or four months since I had left the ashram. But I was supposed to come back on a certain date. And, uh, I just felt like, how can I? How can I go back? I really felt from within that my path was here in Jerusalem and to take on uh, being a Torah observant Jew. But here I was, 37 and a half years old, and I knew Zilch. And I had no, at the ashram, I was the senior sister and I was teaching, and I had like a certain status in the New Age world. And here it was like, start over from scratch, <laughs> you know, like every teenage girl knew more Torah than I did. And uh, like just start over from scratch in a whole new way of life. I didn't know any people here. I had no money, you know, the $2,000 was gonna run out. And how could I just start all over again at the age of 37? And I went down to the, I went to the Kotel. I was from, almost from the beginning, I was living here in the old city. I just loved the old city. I was so attracted to it. And I would go down to the Kotel at night to meditate around midnight after the tourists all left. And um, the Kotel's the Western wall, the last uh, remaining, the, the walls that go around the Temple Mount or from the second temple, they're 2000 years old. And the Western wall, the rabbis say, the presence of God, the Shekhinah, never leaves the Western Wall. So this is where Jews uh, pray, and this is where tourists come. And, and it's just a wall. It has it's no fancy architecture, no embellishments, but the presence of God is there and people experience it. So I used to go and meditate down there at midnight. And one night, I just, I had to make the decision. I went down there and I meditated, and it just was really, really clear to me that I was supposed to uh, to stay and uh, be become a neophyte Jew and start my life over again at the age of 37. So uh, there's a book by Nikos Kazantzakis called St. Francis, where um, St. Francis asks the holy man, like he goes to a holy man and asks him, what is the way to God? And the holy man says, it's not a way, it's an abyss, jump. <laughs> and that's how I felt. I felt that I was just jumping. <laughs> and my brother, who was a doctor, he would say to me, you know, like you're like a cat, you jump off high buildings and you always land on your feet. And I told him, I don't land on my feet, I land in God's arms. So what is the practical life tool? I promised you for, like to have a practical life tool in every one of these broadcasts. Practical life tool is you have to follow your truth. Follow your truth to where it leads you. You have to be very clear that it really is the divine will for you. But once you get to that place of real clarity, that you're not following your desires, not the you know the the lower self is a great ventriloquist. It convinces many people, like you know, like leave your wife and go off with Gladys. You know, uh, it's it's very hard sometimes to distinguish between the lower self and the divine voice within you. But once you have established that that's the divine voice, that this is what you're supposed to do, 
to have the courage to follow your truth and to jump. So, um, so I'm going to stop my story right at this point where I jumped. <laughs> and I look forward to talking to you again in the next broadcast.